Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Good morning, Jacob's Well Church, friends and other guests who are joining us this week. Uh, welcome to those of you who may be joining us for the first time. Uh, we're so glad you did. Uh, and we would maybe ask, would you consider filling out a connection card on our website uh, using the link below? Uh, we'd love to connect with you and see how we can serve you. On this Lord's Day, we celebrate, worship, and remember God's grace to us through the risen Jesus Christ, who has brought us into fellowship with God. On this particular Lord's Day, May 10th this year, we also remember our moms, both our biological and spiritual moms. To the moms of children in the home, thank you for tirelessly sacrificing time and energy for your kids and for their well-being. Thank you for diligently nurturing your children. To the moms of grown children, thank you for continuing to show your kids that you love them and that you're there to listen to them and offer advice. To our grandmas, we thank you for spoiling your grandkids with love and sweets and toys. To those who have lost a mom or didn't have the privilege of knowing a caring mother, we grieve with you over this and pray that you would find comfort in God's tender motherly care. To those moms who have lost children, we mourn with you over the loss you must feel every day, and especially on this day. Thank you for persevering and standing firm in your faith. And finally, to all the women in our church, we acknowledge your role as a spiritual mom, whether it is in teaching our young ones the truth and grace of God's word, uh, or setting an example for young women of our church in life and in purity, to discipling other women in their faith, to showing hospitality to your neighbors. We are thankful for your motherly spiritual care. And so we say to all of these women, Happy Mother's Day. And I must say to my own mother, Hi, Mom. Happy Mother's Day to you. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Hi, Mom. And just as a mother cares for her children, that's right. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. <laughs> and just as a mother cares for her children, let us look to our God who cares for his sheep. And so come, let us worship our God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Come, let us sing praises to him, for he is our God, and we are the sheep of his hand. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that just as a mother cares and nurtures her young uh, just as she tenderly provides for them and makes sure that they are sheltered and makes sure that they have what they need, we thank you that you care for us, that you nurture us, that you are tender with us. And we thank you, God, that you always are watching out for us. We praise you this day that we can gather in this way, a unique way. And we praise you, God, that even though we are physically separated we can know your presence by your spirit. And so we come to worship you in spirit and in truth this day. For you are good, and we want to glorify your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
In view of God's holiness, justice, and truth, let us confess our sins and pray with the psalmist who said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. of sins I have not done. 
Friends, consider the fact of God's forgiving grace for those who trust in Jesus. For it was Jesus himself who said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And in Christ we rejoice. Because for our sake, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. Let us rejoice in our Redeemer and greatest treasure.
Good morning, Jacob's Well Church, and happy Mother's Day to all the women out there in our congregation, both our physical mothers and our spiritual mothers who have shown us the tenderness and the compassion and the love of God for us in Christ in very unique and special ways. We are so thankful for you and for God putting you in our lives. <clears throat> so we give thanks for that. Uh, speaking of moms, we do have some new babies uh, in our congregation, which we are very excited about. First off, want to congratulate Craig and Aaron Boehmier on the birth of their son, Ledger, who was born on March 28th. Uh, big brother, big sister, love uh, holding Ledger, as you can see. Also, we wanted to congratulate Paul and Christy Stinson on the birth of their son, Peyton, uh, who was born, I believe, this past Saturday. And mom and baby and dad are doing well. They're healthy and happy and uh, we're so excited for them. Also wanted to congratulate Andrew and Claire Kirkpatrick on the birth of their daughter, Alice, who was born this past Saturday, uh, their first child. And so we're so excited for them. And so congratulations to you. Uh, if you would please take time just to pray for these parents and for their children. We have several announcements this morning. First off, thank you for praying for the elders of Jacobswell Church as we have discussed how to um, regather together, both in large groups and small groups, particularly for Sunday morning worship. As, as I share this game plan with you, just want to encourage you to hold it with an open hand because we will be continuing discussing this and seeing what the climate is like in our culture in regards to this coronavirus and adjustments might be made. But here is the basic game plan. And the game plan is this, is that this June, uh, in a few weeks, weather permitting, we will start having open air services in our parking lot. Uh, you can either sit in a lawn chair or sit in your car, and we will be broadcasting through an FM radio transmitter. And so all you need is a radio to listen. We'll also be providing Sunday morning services for those who are at home and cannot come there. And so we'll provide that online as well. Uh, we will be serving communion during that time as well. Uh, there's a lot more details to come, but just wanted to give you a heads up. So in June, we'll be having open air services in our parking lot. When it comes to July, we are hoping to move indoors and start streaming our services live. Uh, we'll be taking lots of precautions. Church will look very different, and we will share those with you as it comes. Uh, but, but, but for now, that is our game plan to move into the sanctuary in July. And so continue to pray for us as we continue to reassess all the information and make plans going forward as well. The second announcement is, if you remember this past December, uh, we raised quite a bit of money, more than I thought or expected or hoped for, uh, to feed Haitian churches in, in Haiti. And uh, we've received another request, and this is not for Haitians in Haiti, but Haitians in Florida. Uh, there are four Haitian churches that are sister churches of ours. 85 to 90 percent of those adults have lost their jobs in those four congregations, and they have no access to government assistance at all. Uh, a lot of them lost their jobs because they're in the tourism industry, and obviously tourism has come to a screeching halt. And so they've asked if we would have any interest in supporting those people and those churches. Uh, there's going to be a lot of oversight about how those finances are given out. But basically right now they're giving about $300 uh, per family, depending on how many people there are to help them out during this time. And so maybe with your government stimulus, if you have margin, you might want to take $300 or $600 or $900 and support a family or two. Uh, in order to do that, you, all you need to do is write a check and send it in, and the information will be here on the screen for you. We'll also post it on our Facebook page and in the Weekly Well also, so you can send your support if the Lord leads you that way. Third, I, I wanted to share with you again that today's sermon is PG-13, and so if the kids are old enough to kind of hear and understand what's going on, but maybe so young that they haven't had really important conversations with mom and dad, I want to encourage you to... Uh, to connect them to our children's message, which is going to be uh, posted on YouTube and on our website. There should be a link also in the description of this video of how you can access that. And so you can put the kids in the other room or put yourself in the other room on another device and let them listen to that. Uh, or you can listen with them and then watch this sermon maybe after the kids go to bed. Or there's other options, whatever you think is best. We trust your discernment on that. 
Um, finally, in a minute, I'm going to share with the kids uh, the coloring assignment for this week. Um, but I have to tell you, the, the colorings from this past week were so encouraging, and they ministered to me so much as, as kids took this really abstract idea of drawing out sin and what Jesus does to our sin. I mean, these pictures are, are wonderful. And so I encourage you adults to enjoy these and let these minister to your soul as well as we share them in a little bit. Now, the coloring assignment, just in case you're not a part of Children's Church because uh, Miss Horton will share it there as well. But we want you to to draw some Mother's Day cards. Now, this might be for your mom. It might be for your grandma. It might be for a spiritual mother in the church. Um, it could be for a whole host of people. And you could draw multiple cards. But want to encourage you to do that. And when you're done, uh, please take a picture of it. Again, take it landscape side to side if you're able and put it on our Facebook page or email or text it to me and I will show it off next week. Right now, we're going to continue uh, in worship with a time of fellowship. So greet one another in the Lord. Say, peace be with you. Uh, you can also, you know, stretch your legs, grab some crayons and paper if you need to, uh, to set your kids up for their service. And we'll meet back here in one minute for the preaching of God's word. If you would, please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, the words will also be on the screen for you as well. Uh, in, in my backyard, we have several plants, and one of the plants is this grass that gets pretty tall, probably about knee high, maybe a little bit higher, and it is this beautiful green color. And I love this grass when it pops up kind of in our shrubbery around the yard because I think it's just so beautiful. I, I like it so much that that I'm probably going to make a plant of it and put it in my office because I think it's just so beautiful. My wife, on the other hand, keeps telling me it's a weed and we need to get rid of all of it. Marriage is hard, isn't it? In our living, or sorry, in our dining room, underneath our dining room table, we have a rug. And my wife loves that rug. She thinks it's, it's so beautiful and that uh, it looks so classy and wonderful. I think we should use the rug to catch fluids that drip from our cars. Marriage is hard, isn't it? My wife and I, we've taken a, a five-year break. Uh, we're, we're doing it again, but we took a five-year break from moving furniture together because whenever we moved furniture together, one of us would inevitably start crying. Marriage is hard, isn't it? But what do you expect when two sinners say, I do? You know, some of you here probably hear the examples of the grass and the rug, and you think, really? That's, that's all you got? I mean, we fight over everything. We're constantly yelling at each other. Or the other extreme, we don't even talk to each other. Well, I'll tell you, this is not a contest, but I think we can all agree that marriage is hard. And so if you find yourself in a hard marriage, or if you find yourself in a good marriage, but want it to get better. Or if you aspire to be married someday, or if you have friends that are married, this is God's word to you, to us, for our good and his glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 16. This is God's word. 
Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but his wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come back together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and another and one of another. To the unmarried and the widow, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. And the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Amen. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, as we turn to your word, uh, we are acknowledging that marriage is hard. And we have tried to do marriage our way, and it leads to a lot of frustration and anger and bitterness. And so, God, pray that you would help us to submit to your way of doing marriage, that we would do it in a way that, that the maker of marriage has prescribed for our good and for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Paul is writing to a church that is very confused about marriage and sexuality. As we saw last week and really the previous weeks in the beginning of this book, these are generalizations, but those in the Corinthian church from a Jewish background thought marriage and sex is mandatory for believers because of the creation mandate in Genesis 1 to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Those from a non-Jewish background have not only seen, but also felt the devastating effects of sexual immorality. And so their view of sex has become very tainted. They view sex as something that is dirty and evil and something to be avoided, if possible, even within the context of marriage. And so Paul is writing to a very young and confused church in matters of sexuality and marriage. Up to this point in the letter, Paul has mostly been addressing concerns that he has heard from other people, from other people's reports, like the household of Chloe, as we read in chapter 1. But as we get to verse 1 of this chapter, chapter 7, there's a turning point. Paul says, now concerning the matters about which you wrote. And so these are the topics that they're seeking wisdom about. And it appears that the most pressing issue, the first issue that they brought up to Paul are the topics of sex and singleness and marriage and divorce. Now, to be honest with you as a pastor, this comes as no surprise to me anymore. When I first became a pastor, it was a great surprise at how many marriages in the church and in the community are in utter despair 
When we hired our director of counseling, we told him, get as much marriage counseling experience as you can get. And since he has come here, I think he understands why. Because marriage is hard when two sinners say, I do. The statistics reflect that. 42% of first marriages end in divorce. 60% of second marriages end in divorce. 73%, 73%, almost three out of four marriage, third marriages end in divorce. The average age of divorce is 30. And the average years before getting remarried is three years. And this is crazy to me. There is an average of 100 divorces per hour in our country. I'm not sharing these statistics to single out or to shame those who have been divorced, but simply to remind all of us that marriage is hard, especially when we try to do it our way and not God's way. And so here is the question. How can we do marriage God's way? Since our way doesn't work all that well. How can we have the happiest and holiest, most God-glorifying marriages possible? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is leading in that direction, and it surely isn't exhaustive on the topic of marriage. There are many other places in Scripture, but this is a great passage to help show us how we can make our marriages happier and holier, okay? And so the first way that we make our marriages happier and holier is through serving one another sexually. Now, there's a chance that many of you ladies have just concluded that this is the worst Mother's Day sermon ever. First, you had to kick your kids out of the room, and now I'm talking to you about serving your husband sexually. Now, before you stop the video, if you haven't already, we'll see in this passage this command is not only for the wife, but it's also for the husband. And so let's look at verse 1 together. Paul says, now concerning the matters about which you wrote, you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Paul explains this more more later in the chapter, verses 6 through 9 and verse 25 through 40. And so in two weeks, we're going to have an entire sermon about singleness, okay? But for now, what you need to know is that throughout this chapter, Paul teaches that it is a great advantage to stay single for the sake of the kingdom of God, to do gospel work. And so if someone can stay single for the sake of ministry, they should do that, okay? But Paul continues in verse 2, and he says, But because of your temptation to sexual immorality, again, this is the Greek word porneia, from which we get really any sexual perversion outside of marriage. He says, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Paul is actually addressing several things in this second verse here. Uh, If you're single, he's saying, and you are tempted which is a large majority of the population, he says you should seek out to be married because sex is intended and rightfully enjoyed and most wonderfully enjoyed in the context of marriage, as we studied last week. Paul echoes this thought down further in verse 9 when he says, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. If you are single and you burn with sexual passion, then pursue marriage for the glory of God. If you're single and you can forego sex to do kingdom work, then stay single for the glory of God and gospel ministry. You know, it's so interesting when Christian people are dating or engaged, they'll often cross sexual standards that they never thought that they would. Maybe that's your story. And they feel awful about it and they're repentant about it and they cling to the cross and and, 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 and receive God's forgiveness as they should. But the reason why they cross these personal sexual standards is because they burn with passion. And so I tell people that are dating and engaged that they need to set some strong boundaries and get accountability. And I say to them, listen, I hope you are tempted to have sex before you get married. Otherwise, you shouldn't get married. And so if you burn with passion, number one, get married. But number two, set strong boundaries before you get married. Okay, so that's the first thing that Paul tells us. That if you burn with sexual desire, get married. The second thing is that marriage is a monogamous heterosexual relationship. 
Paul said each man should have, which is a euphemism for sexual relations, but each man should have his own wife. That's singular, not wives, plural, but wife. And each woman have her own husband. Again, singular. Paul is writing into a culture where homosexuality was accepted and endorsed, much like our own culture. But it's also a culture that supported polygamy. And so to make it clear, Paul says, listen, marriage is between one man and one woman. And so in the first two verses, just to summarize, Paul's saying, listen, if you can be single for the sake of gospel ministry, wonderful, go and do that. But if you burn with passion, if you are tempted towards fornication, get married. Okay. On this point, John Piper points out, and I thought this was a really interesting point. He says, when you get married, fornication is no longer possible. Fornication is sex outside the context of marriage. He says, adultery is possible, but fornication is not. And so marriage serves as God's ordained defense against sexual immorality. Paul continues in verse three, And he says, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. The King James Version translates this term conjugal rights as benevolence. It can also be translated goodwill. But in this context, it's obvious that it's a euphemism for sex. But with this in mind, what Paul is commanding us here is that we are to have sex with one another for the sake of kindness towards one another, our spouses, to be make sure we're clear. This means having sex at times, even when you don't feel like it, is a ministry of kindness to your spouse. Paul continues to make this point, saying in verse 4, For the wife does not have authority of her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now, before you chalk this up as misogyny and male dominance, look and see that Paul is giving equal authority to the husband and to the wife over each other's bodies. Verse 5, he says, Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time. Why? That you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again. Paul is commanding regular sexual relations between a husband and a wife. Sex is not something that we're supposed to use as leverage in our marriage, as if, you know, we only have sex with our spouse if they do X, Y, and Z. If that's what we do, if if we only have sex with our spouse when they deserve it, we'll never have sex. And if you are only having sex with your spouse, if they do this, this, and the other thing, in some ways, you're kind of prostituting yourself out. Because you are trading sex for some form of payment, not money, but some other action or behavior. Sex in marriage is not to be used for leveraging your own agendas. It is for showing gospel kindness to your spouse, even when they don't deserve it. Now, as Paul says, you can fast from sex for a season, much like we would fast from food. But he puts three stipulations on it. Okay? The first is that it should be for prayer. It shouldn't be used for manipulation or for other purposes. But if you fast from sex, it should be for prayer. Secondly, that it should be agreed upon by both parties. Both the husband and the wife should agree that they want to fast from sex for the sake of prayer. And the third is that it should be for a limited time. And then you should come back together again. Paul puts these three strict stipulations on fasting from sex because as he goes on to say, he says, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. As much as Satan loves sex outside of marriage, he hates sex inside of marriage. Satan knows that if you withhold regular sexual interaction from your spouse, you are opening the door for Satan to do his work in your marriage and in your lives. Satan hates marriage sex. But God loves it. God loves it when married couples have sex. Did you know that? That it's glorifying to God when married couples sexually serve one another with kindness. It's not as if God is saying, oh no, I can't believe that's happening or if it's a necessary evil. God loves when married couples have sex. You know, shortly after I became a Christian, uh, but before I was married, a a non-Christian acquaintance uh, who was married for a few years told me, they said, you know, you'll have 10 times as much sex before you're married as you will after you're married. 
And they said, you will have more sex in the first two years of your marriage than you will have in all the rest of your marriage. I remember thinking, man, that sounds horrible. I'm encouraged today to find out that God feels the same way, that that is horrible. Married Christians should have the best sex lives of anyone on their street because they know it was created by God for the glory of God, and they know they are only to look for satisfaction for their sexual desires within the context of marriage. And so Christians really should have the best sex lives of anyone in the world. Now let's get very practical here. What does it mean to serve one another sexually in marriage? You know, in pre-marriage counseling, couples have a workbook that they go through. They go through it individually, and then we come together and discuss it. And one of the questions in that book is, is, is about sex, and it's how frequently do you expect to have sex when you're married? And, and it's a really interesting and awkward conversation. It's kind of fun to have, but, but you can tell that the wife is trying to ratchet up her numbers and the husband's trying to ratchet down his numbers. But when I ask them to be honest and say, how frequently do you anticipate having sex? Typically, the woman would say about once a week. And, and the husband-to-be would say, you know, once or twice or three times a day, okay? And so then we discuss, what does it mean to serve one another sexually in the context of marriage? What does it mean to have authority over one another's body? And it creates this great conversation, and we'll discuss it. And, and typically what it means is that they, they compromise for one another. They meet in the middle, and it's not always this way, but usually it means that the wife will have sex more frequently than she wants, and the husband will have sex less frequently than he wants. But each does it to serve one another, to show gospel kindness towards one another. Now, here's the thing. Sex inside a marriage is also often, not always, but often an indicator of the health of a marriage. Often, not always, if a couple is not having sex, it is because their relationship is toxic. And so if that is the situation you are in, you should not just point to these verses and say, look, the Bible says we must have sex because ultimately you don't have a sex problem. You have a marriage problem and you need to get help. And so if that's the context you're in, I encourage you to come talk to me, talk to Pastor Jonathan, talk to one of the elders, reach out to our counseling ministry. We would love to help you work through that. All right, so first, for a happier and holier marriage, we should serve one another sexually. Secondly, we should commit covenantally. Look at verse 10 with me. Paul says, to the married, I give this charge. Not I, but the Lord. What Paul means by this is that he is quoting the teaching of Jesus, right? Jesus taught these things, and Paul is now teaching them to the Corinthians and so he says, to the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. Again, Paul is recommunicating the teaching of Jesus. And so what exactly did te Jesus teach about marriage and divorce? Well, if we look at Matthew chapter 19, Verse 3, we read this. And Pharisees came up to Jesus and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Uh, there was a sect of Judaism that, that had written down that it was okay for a husband to divorce his wife if she burnt the toast. I didn't even know they toasted bread in that time, but if she burnt the toast, he could divorce her. And so they're asking this question. Verse 4, Jesus answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. See, this is God's intention with sex, that two would become one flesh, that in marriage, God would super glue or weld two souls together, that they would not be torn apart, but they would remain together for the rest of their lives. A few years ago, I bought a trailer. You might have seen it or borrowed it, uh, but on the front of the trailer, there was no leg to, to prop up the front of the trailer, so it just hit the ground. And so I went to the store, 
and I bought a leg to put on my trailer. And when I got home, what I realized is that you had to weld this leg onto the trailer. And I had no idea how to weld. And so I called up one of my friends and said, would you come over and weld the trailer, uh, our, the trailer leg onto the trailer? And he said, sure. So he came over and, uh, and he actually put the, the horizontal plate on top of the, the trailer tongue. And so I was thinking that wasn't a good idea. And so I asked him, I said, hey, uh, what happens if, if the weld breaks? You know, what happens if the weld breaks? And he said to me, listen, the trailer is going to break before the weld breaks. See, the weld was, was, was putting two things, making two things one, inseparably one. And to try to rip it apart would break the whole trailer apart. That's why God created sex, to weld souls together. And that's why when people get a divorce, they will often say something like this. They'll say, I feel like I'm being ripped in half. The reason why they feel this is because God has made the two become one flesh and it was not intended to be separated. You see, most people come to marriage as consumers and we all do to some degree, right? But they enter into marriage like it's a contract instead of a covenant. And if either party becomes unsatisfied with this contract of marriage, they simply tear up the contract and move on. But God is saying marriage is not a contract that expires or that you can rip up. Marriage is a covenant in which a man and a woman bind themselves together for life. And there's only one thing that can break this marriage covenant between believers. And it's if one of the spouses makes a covenant with another. And that's what Jesus tells us in verse 9. In verse 9 it says, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. You see, in the case of adultery, when one spouse has sex with someone that is not their spouse, they have broken the covenant. Sex inside of marriage is a covenant renewal of the covenant vows that you have taken on your wedding day. But sex outside of marriage is a breaking of those covenant vows that you took on your wedding day. Do you remember those vows that you took on your wedding day? They probably went something like this. I take you, so-and-so, to be my lawfully wedded husband or wife. And then here's the vows. To have, which is sexual in nature. To have and to hold. From this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do us part, according to God's holy ordinance, which is the covenant of marriage. Do you realize how extreme this is? It is saying, whatever comes our way, whatever happens to you, I'm committed to you. If you go to prison for laundering money, I am committed to marriage and to you. If you become a quadriplegic and you can't move your arms or your legs, I am committed to you. If you kill my favorite, most beautiful grass in the backyard, I am still committed to you. To death do us part. Now, what exactly is God asking us to commit to? As we said, you're, you're committing to the other person, but you're committing to far more than that. Because I think committing to the other person isn't enough. If you are only committing to the other person on your wedding day, that's dangerous territory. The, the marriage can fall apart if you're only committing to that par other person. Here's what I mean. Tim Keller in his book, The Meaning of Marriage says this. He says, when I married my wife, I had hardly a smidgen of sense of what I was getting into with her. And all the married people said, amen, right? He said, how could I know how much she would change over 25 years? And then I love this part. How could I know how much I would change? My wife has lived with at least five different men since we were wed. And each of the five has been me. Because most likely the person you marry is not going to be the person you are married to one year, 10 years, or 30 years later. We have to commit more than just to the person that we get married to. We have to commit to the covenant of marriage and we have to commit to our covenant God. Listen, my wife is amazing. She really is. I'm not just saying that because I'm supposed to. She is an amazing woman and an amazing wife. And when we have, while we have our hard days, for the most part, things are pretty good, pretty happy. We laugh a lot. We sing a lot. Uh, we goof around a lot. We really seem to enjoy each other, which I'm very thankful for. But here's the crazy thing. If I was not a Christian, if I was only committed to Trisha, the Trisha that I dated, 
the Trisha that I married. If I was only committed to that Trisha, I probably would have gotten divorced a few years after we got married. Not because of her or her sin, but because of my sin and my selfishness. But I was committed more than just to Trisha. I was committed to the covenant of marriage. I was committed to God himself to stay married as he has commanded me. Are you covenantly committed to God with your marriage? Are you committed to the covenant of marriage? Are you committed to the person that God has covenantly married you to? Listen, your spouse is going to change. They will do detestable things. They will do things that you can't even imagine. Some days they may even feel like your worst enemy. And so commitment to them is not enough. We must be first and foremost committed to God and his covenant of marriage. Verse 10, Paul continues. He says, to the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. Paul is very realistic. While Paul and Jesus charge believers to remain committed in the covenant of marriage, it doesn't always happen. And so Paul says, listen, if you are separated, you should remain unmarried holding out hope of reconciliation of your marriage. Did you know that one in five divorced people regret getting divorced? They wish they'd never done it. Did you know that 6% of divorced people get remarried to the same person that they got divorced from? God is in the business of reconciling marriages, even the worst marriages, even divorced marriages. And Paul says, if you separate, stay single. Don't break your covenant by marrying and having sex with another person. That is adultery. And two wrongs don't make a right. Hold out the hope of reconciliation. And so how do we pursue holier and happier marriages? Serve each other sexually. Commit covenantally. To God, to marriage, and to your spouse. Finally, hope holily. Okay? I'll admit, when I first wrote this word holily down, I thought I was making a word up, which I'm okay doing. Um, but then I found out it's an actually a word. It's actually a word. And so I looked it up, and holily is an adverb, and it means in a pious, devout, or sacred manner. Okay? So the moral story is, if you don't have a good word, make one up. Maybe it's a real word. All right. Anyways, verses 12 through 16 are written to Christians that are married to non-Christians. Verse 10 through 11 was written to Christian married couples. Verse 12 through 16, which we're about to go into, are non-Christians that are married to Christian. And Paul is calling them to treat their marriage with devotion and sacredness and hope of what God might do through them. Calling them to be faithful and hope holily. Okay. Now, just to be clear, Paul is not encouraging Christians to marry non-Christians. I mean, if you look at the end of this chapter, verse 39, Paul says that you should only marry in the Lord. That means marry to other Christians. In his next letter to the Corinthians that we have, in 2 Corinthians 6, he says, Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for, for what partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? I, I mean, if you look at the Old Testament, really, half the Old Testament is written because the believers of the Lord God disobeyed God's command to only marry those who trusted in him and believed in him. And because of that, they went and worshiped other idols and God had to bring his discipline on them. And he brought militaries and countries to come and bring that discipline. And they were exiled and they were brought back. And all of those things happened because they did not obey God's command to marry in the Lord. And so Paul is not saying, go do missionary dating, right? Go date someone who's not a Christian. But, but God knows, and Paul knows, that as the gospel goes out, there are certain situations where the husband will become a Christian and the wife won't, or vice versa. There's many people in our own congregation. That's their story. And the question is this. If it's true what Paul said in last chapter, that, that we become one with the person when we have sex with them, and if it's true that we are one with Christ, we are members of Christ in this church, and that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit— then should we be having sex with these unbelievers? Should we be staying married to these unbelievers if they're worshiping another God? And Paul says, yes, 
Verse 12, to the rest I say, I, not the Lord. He's again, he's not saying this isn't authoritative. He's saying I'm distinguishing from the previous statement, which was directly the teaching of Jesus. But he says, to the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. I don't think this passage needs a lot of explanation. It's just simply saying, listen, if you are a Christian and your non-Christian spouse wants to stay married to you, stay married to them and enjoy all of the benefits of marriage as much as you can. Why? Paul continues, verse 14, for the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Now, this word holy means sanctified or consecrated or set apart. It can't mean that the unbelieving spouse or unbelieving children are saved simply by their relationship to their believing spouse or parent. We see that it's evident down in verse 16 and several other places in the Bible. But it has to mean something, right? And what it means is that in God's economy, because of a believing spouse or parent, there's something unique about their children and their spouse that makes them holy, that makes them set apart. Uh, this is the reason why, Jake, as well, we practice household baptism. We don't believe that it saves the child, but it's our hope and expectation. But we do believe, according to this passage, that there is something unique about them, that they are sanctified, set apart by God. And so we want to dedicate them to God through the sacrament of baptism. They're set apart. The husband and the children of a believing wife to be hearers and seers of the good news of the gospel of Christ. They get to hear the love of Jesus from their Christian wife or husband or parent. They get to see the love of Jesus at work in their hearts and in their lives. Friends, this is a gift of God's grace. There are many around the world that never get to hear or see the gospel lived out. But a spouse or, 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 or children of a believer get a front row seat to see the glory of the good news of the gospel. It's a special privilege. And it is our hope and expectation that those in the family would see the beauty of the gospel and also trust in Christ for their salvation. It's not a guarantee, but it is our hope and expectation. And so we are to hope wholly. This is actually the story of Lee Strobel, if you know who he is. Uh, Lee's wife came to faith in Christ. And at first he thought that it was just a phase that she was going through. He was afraid that she'd become sexually prude. And so Lee, who was an investigative journalist for a Chicago newspaper, set out to disprove the Bible. And throughout uh, months and years of research, what happened was instead of Lee disproving the Bible, the Bible ended up disproving Lee. And Lee came to faith in Christ because of his believing wife through his, the testimony of his believing wife. And so now he was once a fierce opponent of the faith, but is now a fierce defender of the faith, writing books like The Case for Christ. God works through believing spouses to their spouses, but God also works through believing parents to their kids. Timothy was an example of this. It was his mom and grandma that, that ministered to him, that shepherded him growing up, that led him to faith in Christ. 2 Timothy 1.5, Paul says to Timothy, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. I think this reality is particularly sweet on Mother's Day. Moms, because of your trust in Christ, God says your kids are holy. They are sanctified. They are set apart in a different way. And you have the privilege of caring and shepherding your children in that holiness. This is your primary role as a mother, to raise up the future of the church and help shepherd your kids towards God. I don't know if you know this, but if you attend Jacob's well, one of your pastors was raised by a single mom uh, who was by no means perfect because no mom is, you know that, but she loved Jesus. And now he's one of your pastors. If you don't know which pastor it is, I'll 
just give you a hint, it's the good singing pastor, okay? Well, that probably doesn't narrow it down. But anyways, this is the power of God working through a believing mother, a believing wife, a believing husband, a believing father throughout his family. The point is this. We are to hope holily for our spouse and for our children because God is work through you in your family. Okay. Paul continues verse 15. He says, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such case, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God called you to peace. And so biblically, there are two reasons for divorce. The first is adultery. If your spouse has sex with someone other than you, and let me just say, if adultery happens, the Bible does not mandate you get a divorce. I don't even think it encourages you to get a divorce, but it does make divorce permissible, okay? For the, for the spouse, the spouse that was faithful can issue a divorce. So the first reason is adultery. The second is abandonment. But notice here, only by an unbeliever. And so if they separate themselves from their spouse, physically for sure, but also potentially emotionally, if they take off to just go live somewhere else, then divorce is permissible. And Paul says, you are not enslaved. You're not bound to that other person. This means you don't have to chase after them and try to make it all work out. And it also means, I believe, that it doesn't mean that you're bound to that marriage, that, that they've departed and that you can get remarried. Verse 16, Paul continues, he says, For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? This is a very tricky verse, and commentators actually disagree on what Paul is saying here. And I honestly think either interpretation is probably true. I'm not saying Paul had two intentions with it, but I do think either one is, is valid. Uh, one belief is that if this verse 16 is attached to verse 14, which is encouraging believers to stay married to unbeliever, he's saying, listen, stay married because you don't know how God's going to use you in the salvation of your spouse, okay? But if this is attached to verse 15, where Paul's saying, listen, let the abandoning unbeliever go, you're not bound to them, then what Paul is saying in this verse, in verse 16, is listen, you can't save them. That's God's job. You can be faithful to minister them, but you can't save them, and so let them go. And so here's the thing. When it comes to understanding divorce, and when it is permissible and not permissible, when it comes to remarriage and knowing whether it's permissible or not permissible, it's never black and white, almost never black and white. It's always a very unique and confusing decision. And it's hard to decide on what counts as abandonment and what does not. Every scenario is, is, is different. And so that's why I think Paul is, is not only clear here, but he's also a little bit vague. But here's the good news is that it's that as you consider divorce, as you consider remarriage, God has not left you to do this on your own. It's a difficult decision, but God has given you his church. He's given you the elders of your church to shepherd you and care for you as you make these decisions. I have, I have a loved one, um, someone that is very close to me. I'll just say that. And they love Jesus. And their spouse used to appear to love Jesus as well, but they've abandoned the faith and they have abandoned the family on several different occasions and come back. They have several addictions that they're struggling with, have put the kids in danger and other times. And, and, and this person that I'm so close with that I love, who loves Jesus says, listen, Dan, you've been to seminary. You're a pastor. Can you tell me, is it permissible for me to get a divorce? And what I tell, told them is what I would tell anyone who's considering a divorce. And it's this, go talk to your elders, go talk to your pastor. You should not make this decision on your own. You see, they can investigate the situation. They can go to God's word. They can help lead you through this really difficult and life altering decision. Go to the church and seek their wisdom on this manner. Now, I wasn't trying to dismiss my loved one, but listen, God has put you where you are in your church under godly leadership, and God has given them commands to shepherd you well, and this is an opportunity to do that. In addition, the reason why this is so helpful is if you are considering a divorce and you don't consult with the leadership of your church and you just go and, and get divorced, you're probably going to be wondering the rest of your life, was it okay that I got a divorce? But if you have godly men and women weighing in on this and telling you that it is permissible, 
then you can live with a clear conscience the rest of your life. So here's the point. While the Bible and Jesus and Paul gives us some clear statements on divorce and remarriage, it is very cloudy and every situation is unique. And so we need the wisdom of God and his church to direct us on what is right and good. Let me end with this. Maybe you're listening to this sermon and you have been through an unbiblical divorce. And maybe you've entered into an unbiblical marriage. Maybe you've done this once or twice or five times or 10 times. And maybe you're feeling the weight of your sin and you feel so broken and disheartened by your past. Did you know that there is a very good chance, there are strong indications that the Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter in much of the New Testament, was also married at one time? He was a member of the Sanhedrin, and to be a member of the Sanhedrin, you had to be married. And so Paul's wife either divorced him when he became a Christian, or she died. And so Paul knew what it was like to be married and to become single. Paul knew the pain of that separation. And if you are feeling that pain this morning, can I just remind you of the passage from last week? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 says, Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolater, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says these amazing words. And such were some of you. And he doesn't say your practice has changed or your, your history has changed or your story has changed. But he says this, but you were washed. You were cleansed under the fountain of the blood of Jesus. You were sanctified, set apart by God and for God. You were justified, declared righteous as if you had never sinned in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of God. Your sin from the past has current day consequences. You know that and I know that. But here's the good news of the gospel. Your sin no longer defines you. The work of God in Jesus Christ upon the cross is what defines you. Because at the cross, for all who trust in him, Jesus took on all of our sin, all of our sexual licentiousness, all of our prudeness. Jesus took on our adulterous, selfish, sin-loving hearts. And at the cross, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you divorced me? God, the father, divorced his son because that's what we deserve. And at the cross, Jesus was divorced from the father so that we can be assured that God, our father, will never leave us or forsake us or divorce us. And then three days later, Christ rose from the dead, reconciled to the father, and now awaits us as our heavenly groom. He is. And we are his beloved bride. Listen, all of us are in hard marriages, even if we're in good marriages. To make your marriage happier and holier, God tells us to serve one another sexually and in kindness, reflecting on the kindness of God for us in Christ. To commit covenantally to your spouse, to the covenant of marriage, and most of all, to God himself. And to hope holily that God can work in you and through you in your marriage and in your kids And the restoration of those relationships, especially their relationship with God. Final thing. Some of you are here today listening to this message. And your marriages are not only hard, they are awful. And you don't know what to do. You feel like you're at a dead end. Like it's the end of a cul-de-sac. And you want to hit the eject button. Can you please reach out to me? Reach out to one of our elders or a Christian counselor and get some help. We can help you in those situations. We have helped so many in those situations. And so please reach out to us. Even if you have done before, reach out again. Marriage is hard, but God is good. And his desire is for our marriages to grow in happiness and holiness. Let's pray. Lord, we confess we need your help when it comes to marriage. Even good marriages are hard marriages. All marriages are hard marriages because we take two sinners and put them together and make them one flesh. That's what you do, Lord. And so God, pray that you will help bless our marriages, that communication and reconciliation would happen more and more, that we would love one another with kindness, that we would not abuse one another, Lord. 
that we wouldn't play games with one another, Lord. God, I pray for those who are hurting so deeply, who just cringe throughout this entire sermon. God, pray you'll give them the courage to reach out for help because you are the God who restores broken things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before the benediction, I just wanted to let you know that after the benediction, I'll put on the screen some resources for those who are struggling with sexual sin, with their marriage, with divorce. And so please take courage and make use of these resources. Hear now God's benediction from Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.